Liz Sack is professor at the Department of English and Film Studies at the University of Alberta. Her research are mainly on film festivals, Canadian and Quebec film, on movies and amateur cinema. She's co-editor with André Loisel of A Cinema of Pain on Quebec's nostalgic screen for coming. And she's working on a monograph, uh, and the title is, for now, Your Ticket to Adventure, Travel, Lecture, Filmmaking in Post-War Era. Her most uh, recent article, The Sound of Amateur Film, appeared on Film History this fall. And for today, yes, we are ready. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's see how this is going to work. Um, so uh, the title of my paper, um, From Amateur to Professional, the Bolex H16 a reflex camera and travel lecture filmmaking of Lisa Chickering and Jean Porterfield. Um, before I launch into my paper, I would like to thank, like so many other people have, um, Louis, Andre, and Jean-Pierre for organizing this conference, and of course, Francois Lemay for uh, his generous donation. Um, I also would like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of the St. Lawrence Iroquois, the Wabanaki Confederacy, the Huron-Wendat, and the Abenaki Nation. Um, Okay, so I'm a film historian, and I tend to start with films and then kind of work backwards. So um, recently I've been doing sort of a lot of uh, work with um, films, but then looking at the um, material conditions that gave rise to the production of those, of those films. So when I saw the call for this conference, um, there was a lot of early and, and pre-cinematic um, materials, and that isn't really what I work with. I'm doing a project that's mostly based in the post-war period, but I saw the Bolics there. And the Bolics is a really important camera for the travel lecture filmmakers that I'm um, looking at. So this is part of a uh, larger book project about travel lecture filmmaking in the, in the post-war period. Um, now, many of, as many of you know, and Vincent just did an excellent job of introducing us to Bolex. Um, so it was, uh, from the 1920s to the 80s, a very prominent um, camera manufacturer. And um, in, in Vincent, your title, you had um, amateur sort of filmmaking in Switzerland. I'm going to challenge that a little bit. I want to look at Bolex as a professional uh, medium. So I'm going to argue that Bolex, more than other 16 millimeter equipment, such as co that produced by Kodak or Bell and Howell, became aligned with professional filmmaking by the mid 20th century. So uh, Bolex was successfully marketing its 16 millimeters cameras as the go-to equipment for serious filmmakers working outside of the Hollywood 35 millimeter industrial production sphere. Um, as the Wikipedia page, because that's where we always go for our first bit of information. Um, rightly points out, Payard uh, Bolex cameras were very much used for nature films, documentaries, and the avant-garde. Um, it continues to say that 16 millimeter spring-wound Bolex is a popular introductory camera in film schools, and I think it is still to the to this day for those schools that that at least are um, working in uh, chemical analog film. Um, so the guiding question for my investigation is really quite simple. How did Bolex 16 millimeter cameras become a tool of professionalization for filmmakers? And uh, sort of um, piggybacking off of what Heidi's presentation presented the other day, what challenges does discussing 16 millimeter as a professional um, camera and professional filmmaking pose for our understanding of, of film history. So bringing more 16 millimeter uh, professional filmmaking into the discussion. So my interest um, in these questions stems from this larger project on travel lecture filmmaking in the post-war era. Now I'm sure you're all, let me move my laptop closer. I'm sure you're all familiar with the um, early film lecturers such as uh, John L. Stoddard, Lyman Howe, and Burton Holmes, who projected um, first slides, then uh, films with slides, as Janelle has so amply proven in her talk, and then finally the slides disappeared and they were, they were lecturing solely um, to films. Um, the rise and flourishing of the uh, travel lecture, uh, uh, the travel lecture in the post-war period was in large part attributable to the proliferation of 16 millimeter equipment during the Second World War, and this is something that Heidi um, didn't so much talk about in, in her talk 
talk, but she has written about this, and I know it's going to be in her book, is how much 16 millimeter really did proliferate during the Second World War. Um, so it was used as a tool to educate civilians on their role in the war effort, as well as educate um, and uh, enlisted service uh, men and women. And this helped to develop a robust network of screening sites um, that showed films. So it would have been um, civic and, and social clubs, churches, libraries, museums, concert halls, et cetera. And all of these in the post-war period would become significant, uh, the significant backbone of the non-theatrical circuit. Now, I, I, like Heidi, have a little bit of a problem with the term non-theatrical because a lot of these films were shown in theaters. They were shown in very grand theaters, but they weren't necessarily movie theaters. So they were shown in concert halls, opera houses, um, uh, the theaters in museums, um, all of these very prestigious sites, but not necessarily movie theaters. Um, so the improvements in 16 millimeter projectors, cameras, and film stocks, so it's an ecosystem that's being created in this post-war period that's gonna give rise to the flourishing of the, uh, of the travel lecture circuit. Um, in his study of amateur film, Charles Tepperman has pointed out, quote, the post-war period witnessed a rapid expansion and professionalization of the 16 millimeter film, a field. The post-war era also saw the emergence of independent and avant-garde cinema communities that were increasingly separate from the amateur world, end quote. So I'm really picking up on that separation um, from amateur and professional, that there's really a sort of uh, this divergence that's gonna happen in the post-war period. Now, one of the, um, the sort of robust professional uses of 16 millimeter, and not one that, that Tepperman touches upon, but is the basis of, of my research, was the travel lecture film. And when travel lecturers um, were making their films, they often preferred to shoot with a bolex. Now using a bolex was a, mean t a means to indicate one's serious intentions as a professional filmmaker, as well as to distinguish oneself from an amateur. So of course we've talked about this kind of continuum of amateur to professional. Um, so you can have the home movie maker, the amateur, the semi-professional, the professional, and all of this kind of continues along this kind of spectrum. Um, but I'm really thinking about uh, professional as a term to indicate the pursuit of filmmaking as a sustaining money earning occupation. That is a full-time job. So I'm, I'm trying to distinguish this from amateurs who might be making films on the weekend in their spare time as a hobby, but not necessarily as their job. Um, now Bolick's reporter, which was published from 1950 to 1974, um, was the sort of, uh, it's the, the, the in-house American publication for Bolex. So for a few years, the magazine actually overlapped with Amateur Cinema League's publication, Movie Makers. Um, the last issue of Movie Makers appeared in December 1953, and the first issue of Bolex Reporter appeared in uh, December of 1950. So there's about a three-year gap where both of those publications are um, being produced. So for um, a long time, uh, for a several number of years, um, Bolex Reporter used its mo uh, motto for all movie makers. So at this point, it's seeing itself that its audience for its products is very much home movie makers and, pe and people who might be the more serious amateur or the professional. Um, what we're going to see as the magazine continues, they drop that motto and they very much see themselves as catering to a professional market. Um, so by the 1950s, Bolex began to regularly and consistently promote their cameras as a way to make money. So this is one story from the spring 1957 issue. Now it's interesting that in the same issue, this, this issue here, um, they introduced the Bolex reflex um, camera, the 16 millimeter H. Uh, 16. So that becomes the workhorse, I would argue, of the non-theatrical uh, travel lecture filmmaker. Now to address the question of what role Bolex played in professionalizing 16 millimeter um, 
filmmaking, I want to turn to the careers of uh, Jean Porterfield and Lisa Chickering, a filmmaking duo that had a very successful travel lecture filmmaking career that spanned over 25 years, from the late 1950s until the mid-1980s. So in 1954, Lisa, um, on the right, who is still alive to this day, and I've been interviewing her, she's 95, um, has been incredibly generous with her collection, there's a whole other story behind that, um, but but just the anecdotes she's been telling me about their time on the on the lecture circuit. Jean unfortunately passed away from Parkinson's, probably coming on on ten years ago. Um, in 1944, uh, 1954, Lisa, um, she comes from a prominent piano making family, the Chickerings from Chicago. They, they were a piano producer. So unsurprisingly, her first career was as a singer. And she was pursuing singing and modeling at that time. Um, and she had, a, she had a bunch of singing engagements um, set up in Paris. So she was going off to Paris and she asked Jean, a childhood friend, if she would accompany her. And, and Jean said yes. Now they arrived in Paris and the dates fell through. So Jean quickly took on the role of manager, got her a bunch of other dates, and this eventually turned into a three-year round-the-world tour. So they would get sort of singing engagements and, and they would travel. Now what they also did as they were pursuing their, um, their travels around is they picked up an eight millimeter camera in Rome. So this is um, a home movie made on that trip. And I've selected this bit from, this is obviously not filmed by them, somebody else is filming them, but it's the rare bit of film in this collection of home movies in which they're shown together. So I just love this and they look like they're having a grand time being driven around in this rickshaw. Um, so on this um, trip, they picked up this 8mm camera and they proceeded to document places like Macau, Hong Kong, India, Japan, Iraq, Cambodia, Thailand. They really did do this like very long three-year tour. And when they uh, returned to the States in 1957, they, I, I'm not really sure how the media got a hold of the story, but they became sort of media, a little bit of media celebrities for having done this, this like, sort of these, you know, two gals travel around the world. Isn't that kind of crazy? And um, there's a, a longer story. They're invited to LA. They might work for this guy, Jack Douglas, who runs a um, travel adventure TV show. Uh, so he's interested in, in both having them on his show, but then maybe hiring Lisa as a camera woman to give a feminine perspective on things. But they realize, well, if we're good enough for this guy to hire us, maybe we're good enough to go out on, on our own. So they they don't do anything with Jack, Les, Jack Douglas. They get back on a plane, go back, go back to New York where they're, they're uh, they live, and they're like, we're going to start our own company. So they incorporate a company viewpoints, and then they decide we're going to go professional. So what is the first thing they do? They go and they buy a Bolex, right? We're going to go professional. We need a professional Bolex camera. So they buy, oops, next one. They buy the Bolex H16 uh, reflex camera. Now this, of course, is only a tool. So the girls, as they were referred to in the media, had to learn how to shoot like professionals. With no formal filmmaking training and few apprenticeship opportunities for women, they were entirely self-taught. They learned as they went and studied mainstream films for ideas about camera angles and shot lengths. Frankly, they stated, we learned by studying Hollywood films, panning and zooming, and using a stopwatch with a flashlight to improve our editing and trying to figure out what director David Lean's camera angles were. And I can just imagine, this is, of course, if we're thinking about the materiality of film, I'm imagining them actually sitting in a movie theater watching it with a flashlight and a little, you know, how long are these shots? This is pre-video, right? Like we, the kind of close visual analysis we can do of film wouldn't, they didn't have a steam back at home. They couldn't kind of look through prints. So they're literally like going to the movies and figuring it out. Um, so with the, the Bolex in, in hand, um, they, they uh, decide they're going to make their first feature length travel film and they do. They head off to Austria and they make their first film called Austria a la carte in 1960. And this is again a great photo of them with uh, shooting with the Bolex. Now I should mention that when I came here for the workshop, um, the camera was out for me that, that I was going to be working with and the Bolex that was set out for me had a huge zoom lens on it, it had a big magazine on it and I picked it up and I was like holy 
wow, this is heavy. Um, I've never seen them work with that. All the depictions of them is working with the three turret smaller lens and with no magazine. And I know from speaking to Lisa that they were very, they tried to get really close to people. They have a lot of close ups. And I, and I think that they were women and they worked with a smaller camera. It, they got away with more because they weren't intimidating to people. Um, okay, so because Porterfield and Chickering were shouldering the costs of their production, they could operate outside of the risk-averse Hollywood studio system. So put another way, the commercial filmmaking was only permitting a few rare women, such as uh, Dorothy Arzner or Ida Lupino, the chance to direct feature films. 16 millimeter was a way for women to forge their own paths as professional filmmakers. Now, having said that, I don't want to argue that Bolex envisioned women as the professionals that they were attempting to woo with their products. The history of film technology has long used the trope of women's ineptitude with technology as a way to suggest a technology's ease of use. Um, so women often appear in ads uh, as models, and so quite literally we have here the hand model who is demonstrating, the female hand model, demonstrating how to thread the bolex. So if a woman can do it, it can't be that hard. Um, you know, women are often shown posing with cameras, so they're, they're either being shot with cameras or they're posing with cameras, but they're, they're not that often shown actually using them, right? They're like, look at this nice little camera. So, um, and if they are shown, they're usually, as they are here, book-ended with domestic scenes, right? So the woman is, she's kind of shooting, she's not even really holding it up to her eye, she's just holding it, but, um, and then the baby and the dog. Um, I, 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 you know, there is this uh, cannon or whatever being shot. I'm not sure if she's filming that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna suggest that they're not implying that she's, she's shooting that. So I'm gonna, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a very blunt statement that I think the, the magazine communicates. Men shoot professional films on 16 millimeter. Women make home movies on eight millimeter. Right. So there's this very sexist kind of division of labor. Um, but while this division of labor is kind of propagated in the magazine, um, Heidi Wasson cautioned us the other day, she's like, we can start with print ads, but we sh most certainly shouldn't end there. So this is what they were saying, but this is of course not how women were using the cameras. So women were, many women were picking up 16 millimeter cameras and putting them to use as making documentaries, industrial films, educational films, and of course we know the long history of the avant-garde using Bolex 16 millimeter cameras. So Maya Darren is a very classic example, and you can find lots of uh, photos online of Maya Darren with her, with her uh, Bolex. Um, so Chickering and Porterfield followed in the tradition of women travel adventure filmmakers. So I, I'm not suggesting that they're the first. They, they, there was a long kind of history before them of many wor women working in the travel lecture field. So I just put together a little bit, and these aren't nearly all of them, but I just wanted to give you a little bit of a sampling of women who were working in the field from the 1930s to the 60s. So the women that kind of came before them as they were about to enter um, into the field. Uh, and I don't even have a couple of my key uh, case studies. And I'm looking at another woman called uh, Yordis Kittle Parker, who I haven't got up here. Um, and, I, and I also should point out that not all of them are using um, uh, Bolexes, although there is a Bolex there. Uh, Winifred Walker here, I think that's a Kodak, uh, the, 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 yeah, the special, the early one, because she started in the 30s. She's a really early one. Um, okay, so finding my place here. Right, so they're following in this, in this tradition of the women that preceded them. Um, and while Chickering and Porterfield were frequently profiled in the media, so there was lots of articles about them because there was just such a novelty, right? Um, these sort of uh, travel film career girls, how, how awesome that these women travel and make films. But they also wrote their own articles. And they wrote two articles that was published in Bolex Reporter. So the first of these was published in the May 16, uh, 1964 issue of Oh, sorry, that was the popular photography. So I've lost my place here. Uh, 
I'm going to hold off on that for a second. These articles situated them as proficient professionals with knowledgeable hints to pass along to the Bolex readership. So this was a rare acknowledgement of female expertise. So if you go through past issues of Bolex Reporter, unsurprisingly, it's mostly men who are writing the articles, right? This is supposed to be magazines that tell you how to make your films better. So it was, it was usually men um, writing them. Now, they also published another article in, the, in an issue, and as I said, as Bolex was kind of professionalizing, they would have these are, um, issues specifically on professional uses of the camera, right? So this was all the ways that you could have a career and make money. Um, in both articles, they discuss, unsurprisingly, given it's a magazine aimed at Bolex users, why they chose the Bolex, Bolex H16 camera. Now, in the first article, flip back to this one, on travel films, which appeared in 1964, they state the importance of the camera's lenses, the fact that it was a reflex camera, so assuring a clearly focused picture in exactly what they were looking at, and it was easy to handle and lightweight. And I'm, I'm thankful to Vincent for explaining part of the reasons why this lightweightness was, was possible. They continue to point out that it also performs well in variable weather conditions through sub-zero conditions and storms in the Alps, strong winds, salt and sand of the Caribbean, and the humid jungles of South Africa. So as um, an owner's manual for Bolex, I think my slides might be out of order here. Okay, here we go. So the they also um, showed the same kind of conditions, right? So there's a guy filming in the Arctic, and then this one is obviously on some kind of boat in the tropics, and then we get the representation of the sort of exotic other. So this was entirely in keeping with how Bolex envisioned their cameras would be used by these adventurous um, filmmakers. Now, in their... Um, second article, they wrote, so this is again, they go back to why they chose the Bolex. So for one thing, it's switch our lenses. When we show our films, the picture is often projected from a booth over 100 feet from the screen. So each frame must be the highest, sharpest quality. Then there's not only the sturdiness and reliability of the camera itself. When shooting a film, we're always many thousands of miles from home, sometimes high up on a sub-zero snow-clad peak sometimes in a humid tropical rainforest or jungle. There are certainly places one can't afford a camera breakdown. And knock on wood, we've never had that unhappy problem. Unnecessary pounds can be a real liability. A, pho a photographer of documentaries and travel films must be unencumbered and able to move fast in order to capture the unexpected. So this is a real kind of um, classic description of why the Bolex was such an ideal camera. So a number of things here. Um, already the lenses, right? So the idea, and I think this is part of the move towards professionalization, is that if you have really good lenses and then the film is projected in these big um, theaters, it's going to look good. Uh, so the sharp quality, but also the idea that it, it's going to be projected from a, a booth potentially very far away. And so I want to show just a couple of images. So here they are presenting at the Spokane Coliseum. Now this was one of the largest um, venues on the circuit. And the Coliseum is like a Coliseum, it's like a, 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 a sports arena, right? So it's not, this is not one of the nicer theaters that they are performing in, but it is huge. I've, I've seen other numbers that claim that it holds 7,800. So I'm gonna have to double check how much it holds. But either way, it's a really big audience. Now I looked at this photo and I'm like, I don't know where the, the booth is. I don't know where the projector is in this, this photo. I've tried kind of, you know, zooming in and I can't figure it out. Um, but the point being, it's going to, it's gonna have a long throw. There's also this image from my hometown, which is from the Jubilee Auditorium. And again, they're performing to a fairly uh, large house. So not only does this show kind of the, the professionalism of the, that 16 equipment that would uh, be necessary, but also how incredibly popular these were. Um, okay, so there, the quotes um, 
both from Lisa and Jean, and also um, the images in the manual for the camera really shows the importance of what this camera could be for travel filmmakers. So the durability, portability, and use in various climates, right? So this really did, because they did shoot in South America, um, they did shoot in the Alps, they did kind of go to these kind of variable um, locations. Um, they had a very successful career. So they not only made um, the travel uh, lectures, so those are the five feature length travel lectures that they traveled the circuit with, they would also use those films as raw material for other kinds of films. So they produced uh, short educational films as well. So uh, um, Aust uh, Four Seasons in Austria is derived from Austria à la carte, and you can sort of figure out the other ones. Um, so I wanted to actually kind of circle back to the filmmakers because I am, um, this really did, was spurred from the, the filmmakers. And I want to show you a short clip from a film called um, Portugal with Pleasure, which is one of the educational films. So I'm showing you an educational film because um, it would have the sound and music on the film, whereas with the live narration, that's one of the, the hardest parts of this research, is because it was an ephemeral live soundtrack, um, is tracking those down. So some have been recorded, um, often the filmmakers would type out their narration, which they would then either memorize or have little cue card cheat cards as they were um, presenting them. So, uh, yeah, so I'm gonna show a little bit. Oh, and this is, okay, so I'm showing this little kit. Paul, this is for you because we your presentation about baggage. So I'm just gonna set this up a little bit. Because they were women filmmakers, they were constantly asked about packing. What is it like to pack? Because of course women have all the accoutrements of their makeup and their clothes and their shoes. So this is, they, they kind of played off of that. They turned that into like um, a, a joke in a number of their films about this idea of packing. and off they go on the Volkswagen wagon. Now, um, it, it may come as no surprise that they actually got sponsorship from Volkswagen. So one of the things they would do is they would, they get sponsorship from airlines and show a shot of, the, of them arriving on the plane. Oh, there's a great shot where they're on a flight, I think it's KLM, and they're going down the aisle with a dessert cart which is just laden with all these desserts and, and the seats are huge. And I was like, oh, this was when air travel was actually luxurious, right? Not the way we're now packed in like sardines. Um, okay, so uh, on that note, I kind of wanted to leave the last word to the filmmakers. So I'm gonna um, conclude on that and thank you. I, I don't know if it's a question, but maybe a, a comment that could interest you, uh, Liz. Uh, when you read the minutes of the um, executive committee's uh, meeting at the very beginning, when Payal just bought the um, ball Bolex from uh, Bolski, and they realized that the camera is not fit for you know uh, a big industrial production, they have to rethink everything, and uh, so they some and they barely knew anything about filmmaking. So there's a guy, we're not sure who exactly, I think it's one of the engineers, uh, Monsieur Nicole, it was called. So he starts a project and he says, well, we have to distinguish ourselves from the very sophisticated American cameras. And he says, how could we do that? So he said, we have to uh, make cameras for women. And that's one of their very first, in the very first project from for the, the camera that will become the H, H16, they say we have to do a very simple 
lightweight camera so that women can shoot their family. So there's really this link with women and domesticity. But then Renault comes in. Uh, Renault, uh, Vincent talked about, and he over engineered <laughs> this thing. You know, he, he just wants to put every small functionality that he reads about. So he makes this really sophisticated machine. And when it comes out, they realize a bit, they're a bit astonished to realize that, wow, I mean, this camera is, I mean, we, s we sell so much cameras in the US for professionals, and they're kind of surprised, and they realize that's not what we wanted. It's not a camera for women, and that's not, uh, and they, at this point, they started to manufacture the L8, and you see in the ads, there's always like a, a purse and a little glove, and it's clearly for, for women. But at first, the H16, the, the first project was actually meant for, women, but the over engineering thing became something else entirely. So that's, I, I yeah. thought it was pretty interesting. No, uh, that's fantastic. Thank you for, for telling me that. And I love the fact that it was like, okay, so it's, uh, I mean, it does sort of um, reiterate what I was saying, that idea that, well, if it's for women, it's got to be really simple. And then when it gets over engineered, it becomes this professional tool. So thank you for that. And I'm going to come to you for, um, you know, uh, citations. Thank you. Question remark. Moi-même, j'en ai une. Tu vas. Uh, yesterday, the, the definition professional came up, and it's come up again today. And uh, I was thinking, I did a little research. The definition de la amateur en français, c'est différent en anglais. I think no. Oui, c'est le, le amateur en français. It's, uh, in English, they would define it as a lover of. And so I, I, I think you can be a professional amateur, <laughs> you know. Um, anyway, um, that was just one small thing. And also, uh, I was thinking of um, The Crown. I watched uh, the Netflix series of The Crown, and... I don't know if anyone else has seen it, but there's that great scene where uh, King George gives Queen Elizabeth a bollocks. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, so yeah. that's, yeah. I don't know. I don't know why I thought of that, but uh, I did. There that's not a question. No, there's great, there's a, a bunch of great scenes in films where women are given cameras, and I, I love them, right? Like this idea, but my favorite is actually, it's so interesting that Lisa and Jean mentioned David Lean, because I don't know how many of you have seen David Lean's Summertime. Catherine Hepburn is a single woman who goes on vacation to Rome, which is kind of risque. She's on her own in Rome, and she has a movie camera, and it gives her kind of justification to roam around the city, roam around the city, roam around Rome, and take um, home movies. And so I'm wondering, they bought their camera in Rome. Like, I keep making these connections, because he made that film in the 50s. They're in Rome in the 50s. They buy an 8 millimeter camera. It kind of gives them permission to then become filmmakers. It really is quite interesting. And in terms of the um, amateur professional, um, yeah, that's been picked up on in, in, in English language literature about amateur. So there's a, a book about um, amateur avant-garde filmmakers in the, in the 1920s called Lovers of Cinema, because it, it picks up on that. Patty Zimmerman in her book talks about amateurs, lovers of cinema. There's work been done on the amateur professional. So all of, all of these kind of teasing outs are happening within the scholarship on amateur filmmaking. Um, I'm definitely trying to push it a little bit more into the whole 16 millimeter professional filmmaking, which I don't think has been, I'm sort of looking at Louis because he researches on this too, but I don't think there's been that much done about like talking about 16 millimeter as a professional filmmaking tool. Yeah, a lot of research to be done. On yeah. Yeah, the prof professional, um, I'll try to say it, the professionalization of uh, 16 millimeter in the mostly in the 30s and during the war war years. Yeah. So. I, I was wondering, uh, Liz, if you if you had any more information on Bolex Reporter, uh, as because w when you talk about going further than the the ads, Bolex Reporter is kind of it's hard to to know what what it is exactly because it's a like movie makers, it's a it's, it's a magazine for, I'm 
amateurs and, and filmmakers, but I it's also clearly uh, an advertisement for uh, Bollex products. Mm -hmm. And you know the sentence that you showed, uh, that it, it can go to Arctic and to the jungle, and it, it I mean, I've read it, 300 times in, in, in all the Bodex uh, reporters' article I've read. And I, I was wondering if they, were they paid to write those articles? Uh, uh, I, I don't know how to, huh. you know, to because uh, like for the Hamidvar brothers, who were two Iranian brothers who just went off uh, to, to travel and they bought a, a Bodex in Australia. And bit by bit, they, they professionalized, they became professionals. And they started to get uh, sponsorship from Matchless Motorcycles and Citroën. Um, they wrote an article for Bodex, and it's clearly an ad. It's clearly something that, I mean, it fits all the publicity of Bodex. So I was wondering, right. is it, were they paid? Did you find any information on this? Or? That's a really good question, whether they were paid. I can ask Lisa if she remembers whether they were, great, they, yeah. they were paid to write those yeah, articles. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't, I, I mean, I'm sure they saw it as promotion of their careers of as well. So it was good for them to have any profile. Mm -hmm. um, but whether they got, but you're absolutely right. Yeah, they always, I mean, the article's kind of funny because it's, um, it does talk about them on the lecture, but there's always the two paragraphs that talk specifically about the camera and what it can do. So Maybe that was, uh, you know, uh, y y y you do your part, but you also advertise our cameras. So maybe yeah. it was like a terrain d'attente between the two. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Moi, j'ai aussi une question au niveau archive pour Lise. J'ai donc lu qu'il y a cette collection au Smithsonian Chickering and Porterfield. Est-ce que tu peux nous en dire quelque chose? Yeah, so uh, Viva, before introducing me, she's like, oh, so you, you went to the Smithsonian and worked with this archive. And I said, I took it to the Smithsonian. And she's like, oh, there's a story. So um, in doing this research, I kept coming across Lisa and Jean's name. Well, not always, but I came across them. And I was like, wow, these two women who were billed and presented together because it was dominated by men. So a lot of men, kind of adventure, pith helmet. I'm going into deepest, darkest mm -hmm. Africa. And yet there are these two women who were billed together and they shared the stage. So one would present for the, for the first half of the film, they would take an intermission, and the second would narrate the second half. And as you saw in the images, they were on screen a lot together. So it was a really equitable shared um, relationship. So I was really intrigued with them. Um, and then I just Googled their names, found that Jean had passed away, but Lisa had been the um, president of like a travel photographer's guild. They moved into, into um, photography in the mid 1980s and Paul this is I thought of you when when I was thinking about this quote from Lisa and I was like well why did you move into photography and she said travel lecture filmmaking was back breaking work and you were talking about the burden of the of the work and and they had to travel to make the films but then travel to show the films and if you're traveling to a theater that doesn't have equipment you have to bring equipment and I mean it's itinerant filmmaking well into the 80s I'm totally off tangent so um, I just phoned Lisa I, f I found her phone number and I phoned her. And I said, hi, I'm Liz Zach. And she said, I don't know you, and hung up on me. Yeah. And I thought, okay, she's a senior. She doesn't want to get scammed. I totally understand. I phoned her back. I said, please don't hang up. I'm a film studies professor. I'm phoning you about your films. I don't want to sell you anything. And she sort of paused because she's like, oh, somebody that knows that I was a filmmaker. So I explained my project and all of that. Um, very long process of gaining her trust and developing a relationship with her. But she finally invited me over. All their films were under her bed, in her bedroom. All the photographs that they had taken were in binders in a little office in her apartment in New York. Um, they were a lesbian couple, they had no children. And I was like, this is going to end up in a dumpster if she dies. She was 87 when I met her. So I panicked. I was like, "We, I need, I need to get this in an archive. But it's not like you just turn around and say, hey, give me your life's work, and I'll find an archive for it. It took a very long time to, um, can, you know, she was in denial of her own mortality. She didn't have a will at that point. She didn't want to think about giving it away because it, it meant that she wouldn't be around to always protect it. Um, so that took a very long time. Um, I gained that trust. She finally um, did decide to donate it. I'm friends with an archivist at the Smithsonian for the Human Studies Film Archive. 
um, they accepted it. Um, and over two summers, I drove it down to Washington. So I'm like driving down, backing up my Prius, opening up the hatch and unloading all the stills and papers and films and everything else. And I have to say it was one of the most satisfying moments in my academic career to date, to get that in an archive. They then got an intern that summer. It has been cataloged. There's a beautiful finding aid online that you can find easily if you're interested in knowing more about it. She didn't want her home movies in the archive. I took those and had them digitized. That's what you saw. Got a nice scan done at the Provincial Archives of Alberta. So we have a complete collection. All their home movies, their travel lectures, and I think mm, all of the educational films as well. So. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.